The Montana Historical Society welcomes you to the ceremony to induct Mildred Walker and Joseph Medicine Crow into the Gallery of Outstanding Montanans. Thank you for joining us for such a wonderful and celebratory occasion. The Gallery of Outstanding Montanans was established by the state legislature in 1979. It was conceived of as a way to honor, in a truly fitting manner, those citizens of the treasure state that have reached the highest level of their chosen field, whatever field that might be, and in reaching that level made contributions to, of statewide, national, and even international significance. Initially, the gallery was administered by the Montana Arts Council, but since 1981, the Historical Society has had the pleasure of overseeing this program. Since the inception of the gallery, 46 people have preceded Mildred Walker and Joseph Medicine Crow into the gallery, which is located in the hallway west of the Capitol Rotunda. Each inductee is honored for an eight-year period. After that, their plaque is removed from its niche in the west wing to make room for new inductees. But the names of the retiring honorees are added to the introductory panel, which serves as a permanent record of all former inductees. In addition, the biographies of former honorees are also available on the Montana Historical Society's website. As you are no doubt aware, Montana is full of men and women who deserve the designation of outstanding. Therefore, it has never been an easy decision to select from the many deserving candidates the inductees into the gallery. However, this year's inductees are enormously qualified to be honored in such a manner. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce another outstanding Montanan, Governor Greg Gianforte. It's a pleasure to be with you today to honor the achievements of two Montanans who have made significant and long-lasting contributions to our great state. These individuals, and many who have come before them, have shaped Montana into the state we are today. People like Helen Clark, a Blackfeet educator and Indian advocate. People like Alma Smith Jacobs, who served as the head librarian of the Great Falls Public Library for almost 20 years before becoming the Montana State Librarian in 1973. A historic first for an African-American woman. People like James Welch, an internationally acclaimed, award-winning Blackfeet and Grovant author. People like Maurice Hillman, one of the most important, yet least well-known U.S. scientists of the 20th century, who developed more than three dozen vaccines. People like John G. Link and Charles S. Hare, architects who designed over a thousand buildings across the state. And people like Fanny Sperry Steele, champion bronc rider and first woman in Montana to receive an outfitter's license. These Montanans have helped make the treasure state what it is today. That's why they've been awarded a well-deserved place in the Gallery of Outstanding Montanans. Today's inductees have also made a significant impact on our great state in their own right. Mildred Walker as a celebrated novelist and Joseph Medicine Crow as a respected Crow historian. Both Mildred Walker and Joseph Medicine Crow are Montana treasures. Today we celebrate their accomplishments and reflect in our own lives on others who have made Montana a better place to live. God bless you and God bless Montana. From 1933 to 1955, acclaimed novelist Mildred Walker called Montana home. As a wife and mother of three children, she navigated the intersection of her personal, social, and professional life and was able to enjoy an exceptional literary career while living here. During this time, she wrote nine of her 13 novels, three of which were set in Montana. Critics praised Walker for her, ex her exceptional ability to capture both ordinary human experiences and the authentic environments in which their characters lived. She wrote from firsthand experience, showcasing a modern, unromanticized version of Montana. These writings, writing hallmarks led the Philadelphia Inquirer to declare, you are either a Mildred Walker enthusiast or you are missing one of the best writers of the American scene. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Oliver Shem, who will be speaking on behalf of Mildred Walker. Mr. Shem, grandchild of Mildred Walker, is a professor of art at Castleton University. He currently lives in his grandmother's house in Grafton, Vermont. He has graciously agreed to make comments for the entire Shem family. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Oliver Shem. 
the one of the many grand ch grandchildren of Mildred Walker. And I wanted to thank the Montana Historical Society for this wonderful award, this outstanding Montanan um, that Mildred Walker has received. And I just would like to say that as a representative of the family, I am so happy to be able to be here and talk um, about Mildred. And just in case this happens, I may call her Gran because that's how I knew her. She was my grandmother, she was our grandmother, and we called her Gran. So interchangeable, Mildred and Gran. Mildred, from the time that she was seven years old, knew that she was, she wanted to be a writer and she was constantly writing. Um, she loved the place of Vermont where she would go during the summers. Her parents had bought a small house. This house I live in now, right on a brook with woods and a covered bridge in the distance. And here she really learned to observe the landscape. They lived in Philadelphia, a very urban place, but here she was free. She was free to be in the woods. She was free to also observe the people of the village. And this ability, which she honed, is what she took into her writing and took into all these different places that she lived. Vermont, Michigan, Montana, these are the places where her books were set, all places where she had lived. Um, there's a sense of place in her novels um, and, her, and her characters are set in that place. They're set in the landscape. The characters though, there are, they are a part of the landscape and they themselves, they have a, an inner landscape of thoughts and emotions and interactions and the way that Mildred weaves these together, the people, the characters and the landscape, they are both alive and they are both interacting. Um, and this is true in all her books. James Welch, another outstanding Montanan, uh, suggested to the University of Nebraska Press that they should consider reprinting Winter Wheat. And they decided they, they did, they decided they would. And the book was a great success. And that's when they realized that they should go ahead and reprint all of Mildred Walker's books. And this revelation that what she had written and what she wrote about, about place and character was still relevant today. And there was a great joy within the family, but also that Mildred Walker was being taught in English classes again. Herself a professor of English, for 13 years at Wells College. It was a wonderful thing. Ripley Hugo, her daughter, um, married to Richard Hugo, another outstanding uh, Montanan, uh, wrote an excellent memoir about Mildred Walker's life. And I wanted to read an excerpt from that. All 13 of Mother's novels are set in one of three locales, New England, the Midwest and the Rocky Mountain West. Vermont, the source of her childhood impressions is the setting of four of her novels. When mother married in 1927 and went to live in Michigan for six years, her written notes and lectures about her writing indicate that she gathered ideas for the Midwest novels during these years. Mother lived the next 22 years in Montana, the setting of her fifth, sixth, 10th and 12th novels. The first of the 13 novels was published in 1934 and the last in 1972, a span of 38 years. Mother should have, should have the last word on the question of place. She insisted various times that it was not her settings, but her characters who lived in those settings that were the most important to her. However, her setting influenced a character's life, she pointed out. And then the setting was strongly present. In that sense, she conceded, she wrote a Midwest, Montana and Vermont novel. This biography 
sets forth mother's impressions of her own living in the settings, side by side with her characters who emerged in these settings. Its structure has been determined by knowing her daily life, but also discovering her writing life. I urge you, if you're interested in Milda Walker, to read this, Writing for Her Life, Ripley Hugo. Um, this idea of her writing life and her daily life, I think is a very important thing. And the introduction to Mildred Walker touched on this same idea. As grandchildren, we only knew her as a grandmother. We really did not know about her inner writer life at all. Um, later on, I'll give you some memories of the grandchildren of Mildred. But we learned much later about her writer's life and her inner thoughts through reading her books. And it opened up a whole aspect of her as a, a creative person, as a writer, as a woman growing and living in the West and these different locales. When it comes to her personal life, when it comes to her husband, something that I always thought was amazing is that they really seem to have a contemporary relationship. There was an equality that you didn't necessarily see in the 20s and the 30s. They were a team and they both nurtured each other's career. They were equally important careers. Her writing career and Ferdinand Shem, his research as a physician in Great Falls. Uh, and of course there was their social life with, with another aspect of it. And they had a great um, intellectual group of friends, Joseph Kinsey Howard um, and some of these other great writers and they would, A.B. Guthrie Jr., they would all come together and, and a lot of them had cabins in the Rocky Mountain front and they would gather and they would have these great parties and discussions. And this was a part of their life too. Uh, so when it comes to being one of her grandchildren um, and not quite knowing what her writer's life was like, what her inner thoughts were like. I came across a, a, a writing that she had created and it really to me sort of touches on this aspect of who she was and especially who she was when she was younger, growing up in Vermont, honing those skills of observation um, that she used within her writing itself. In Vermont, in this place, there's a lovely brook and every single one of her grandchildren played in that brook. In Montana, Ferd and, and, and Mildred bought a lovely cabin on the South Fork of the Teton River. Uh, another beautiful river, clear as can be from water that came up from the mountains, drinkable and clear and pure and lovely and all her grandchildren played in that river. Her kids, my father, all of them. So this is talking about a child within the river. The sun makes you thirsty. You put your face way down against the water, letting it sting your eyes and run in your nose until you gulp and choke. What if a minnow or a water bug swam into your mouth? You draw up quickly, dripping water, the tip of your nose, but dropped as an old, old man's. There's a blue stone there, blue as a robin's egg. But when you thrust an eager clutching hand, not that one, the next one, and bring up the stone, it is ordinary, gray pebble, dull as cement. There's one over there, all speckled black and white, distinct as a polka dot. But you bring it up and it is blurred in a monotone like a Plymouth rock hen. Over there, there's an orange stone the color of flame, as bright as maple in the fall, but you leave it there, even at seven, you learn some things are best left where they are. Stone magic fades above the water's rim. My brook in the summer is made for a child. There is no death in it, no passion. There is the monotony of nursery rhyme in the running of its voice. It goes on and on and on to put the child to sleep, and yet it pushes towards the deeper river, 
even the Connecticut. It is drawn always towards the sea and hurries to that end as a child hurries towards maturity. It runs with time. There is no beating it. First I was seven, then I was 12, then 17, then 27, and now 30. The stream allows no hanging back. It is clear as truth. She wrote that when she was 30 years old. And to me, it was in a way an epiphany to suddenly see really how my grandmother experienced the world, the natural world, herself, herself in that world. And her, her books reflect that. So I gathered some um, memories of my grandmother that I wanted to relay with you from uh, my uh, cousins and my siblings. And so this will be, uh, essentially I'm reading quotes and I'll give a little bit, uh, explanation um, when needed. I loved it when she would come to Christmas in Montana and we all were there at the cabin. I remember her vividly on the big bed in the front room of the tupa and how much in her element she was. Uh, the tupa was the cabin's name, uh, finished for one room cabin. And how much in her element she was with children all around her, hanging on every word, stories about our own parents. It totally sets the scene. She loved having family around her. Um, so here's another one. All, I always think of Gran as the fun grandmother. She was mischievous, she was. And she was naughty and had a great sense of fun. She would sit next to me at dinner and pinch me under the table. And I would say, Gran pinched me. And she would look aghast and deny with great gusto. Oh no, you always had so much energy. She always had so much energy and loved walking. And this is true, a theme that I saw again and again. She loved walking, um, a great New England stride as one of my cousins said. Uh, and she was always taking us out. And that was passed down to her kids and then to her kids' kids. We love to hike, to be out in the wilderness. All the rules and properness in Grian's household, but at the same time, she was mischievous. There's that word again. So she was very sort of regimented when it came to etiquette and how things would be. She wanted to teach us well to be out in the social world, but at the same time, she could have fun. She also loved reading to us. Um, she would sit us all down and she would have these little sort of, know, we called them toothpaste candy because they weren't very good, but they were kind of chalky. And she would read from excerpts from different books, uh, Puck's, Puckapook's Hill, or uh, later on, um, some more contemporary works. I loved her New England stride. I remember walking to the Peace of the World, which was a great serpentine rock up in the woods. She wrote a juvenile novel about it, A Peace of the World. Um, her stride was so long I could barely keep up, keep up with her. And I'm a fast walker, and yes, she is. She was truly fun and funny and so enjoyed gatherings, especially when all the family members came to see her. I remember her great joy in welcoming, welcoming us into her home for a visit. Arms wide, wide open and over her head in welcome, hello! And the same thing when she drove away with great waves until we finally turned the bend. So, this was her personal life. This was her grandmother persona. And what I'm so thrilled about is that in writing these books, she gave all of her grandchildren's a great gift on who she was and how she was in the world. And that great gift expands and extends to everyone who reads one of her 13 novels. So I thank you for this award and I truly appreciate it that uh, Mildred Walker is considered one of the outstanding Montanas. Thank you. As a young boy, Joseph Medicine Crow was surrounded by history. His family told him many stories of the Crow tribe and their way of life before the reservation. He carried this legacy with him throughout his life. As the first Crow male to receive a college degree and the first Crow to receive a master's degree, education became a way of life for him. 
During his life, he served as Crow tribal historian and anthropologist, drawing on his formal education and family traditions to become the foremost authority on Crow history and culture. Dr. Medicine Crow also gained notoriety during service in World War II. While in Europe, he made history by fulfilling the four traditional acts required to become a war chief, the last such person to attain this feat. Awards and honors arrived later in life, multiple honorary doctorates, for acts of military heroism and bravery, the U.S. Bronze Medal and the French Legion of Honor Medal in 2008, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2009. An extraordinary life of 103 years is not easily summarized, but perhaps his greatest legacy is as an inspiration, role model, and mentor to all who knew him. Speaking on behalf of Joe Medicine Crow is his son, Ronald Medicine Crow. Mr. Medicine Crow currently lives near Lodge Grass, Montana, and during his life has worked for the Crow Tribe Natural Resources Department as a rancher and rodeo hand. Today, he serves as a minister for the Pentecostal Church. He has provided a set of written comments that he has requested to be read by one of our staff. Hello, my name is Aaron Jenton, and I'm the Collections Historian at the Montana Historical Society. I will be reading these remarks for Ronald Medicine Crow. Kahe, Kahe, which means in Crow, greetings to the Montana Historical Society. This is a good day. This is how my dad would have greeted everyone. Hello, my name is Ronald Medicine Crow, son of the late Dr. Joe Medicine Crow, or Highbird, which is his crow name. I received word of this great news from Mr. Aaron Jenton that my late father was selected to be given honor in the Montana Historical Society Gallery of Outstanding Montanans. It gives me much pleasure and humble gratitude to receive this honor for my father. I have asked Mr. Jenton to read my letter on my behalf. I want to acknowledge my two sisters, Diane Reynolds and Garnett Watton, who are both pleased and happy about this honor being given to our late father. I am 73 years old, and I have been married to my wife, Clarice, for 51 years. We have four adult children and one deceased, eight grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, and we take care of our nephew. They are all happy about this honor as well. I am a retired rancher and rodeo hand. I worked for the Crow Tribe and Natural Resources. Today, I am a lay minister of the gospel. There is no retirement with this work, but I am happy with it. Now, if I were to write all of my dad's accomplishments, I would have to write a book. Speaking of books, my dad wrote a book called Counting Coup, which I encourage you to read if you have not already. So what I am going to share are some of the highlights of his career. This is a quote by one of his many friends. If this was Japan, Joseph Medicine Crow would be a living cultural treasure, for he is a unique individual by anyone's standards. He was the first member of the Crow tribe to graduate from Bacon College at Muskogee, Oklahoma, and the first to obtain a master's degree in anthropology at the University of Southern California. Later, he received honorary doctorates from both institutions. He was working on his doctorate in anthropology before World War II interrupted his studies. Although he was offered a commission because of his college background, he refused on the grounds that a warrior must first prove himself in battle before becoming a leader of men. Descended from a long and famous line of Crow war chiefs, my father went on to distinguish himself on the battlefields of Europe, where he counted the four war deeds, counting coup, on the Germans. This was the Crow tribal custom. This was conferred upon him by old warriors and elders of the tribe after the war, making him a chief. While fighting the Germans, my father was defending his great-great-grandfather's homeland, Pierre de Chain, a Frenchman who married a Crow woman on his maternal side. In 1948, my father was designated as the tribal historian and anthropologist by the Crow Tribal Council. What makes his work especially valuable is the fact that as a scholar, as well as a storyteller, he understood the strengths and weaknesses of both oral and recorded history. He used his education well to become a person of respect and renown. Over the years after World War II, he was involved in many projects and activities. 
In 2008, the French government awarded him the French Legion of Honor, Chevalier, making him a Knight of France. The U.S. Armed Forces and the National Guard out of Billings, Montana, awarded Dad with the Bronze Star at the same ceremony. The following year, 2009, he was awarded with the Presidential Medal of Freedom in Washington, D.C. by President Barack Obama. I would like to share four quotes that my father lived by. Number one, honor comes to him by the life you live. Number two, honor comes to him by the prayers you make. Number three, honor comes to him by the sacrifices you make. And number four, honor comes to him by the accomplishments you achieve. These were true to his life. Even though we are his family, we feel so blessed to have known him and proud to call him dad and grandpa. We surely miss our times with him. We want to thank all the members of the Montana Historical Society for this opportunity to thank you and share some highlights of my father's life. As my dad would say, aho, aho, meaning thank you. And thank you, Aaron Jenton, for reading my letter. We, the Medicine Crow family, are grateful and proud of our dad and grandpa, the late Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow. High Bird was the last traditional chief of the Crow tribe. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shane Doyle, who will perform an honor song for Dr. Medicine Crow. Shodaje, thank you for taking a moment out of your day to reflect on my hero, Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow. Hello, my name is Dr. Shane Doyle, and I'm a member of the Upsalaga Nation. And growing up, Joe Medicine Crow was always someone who I revered, someone who really was a role model to me. And uh, made me want to be a better person. And so I'm very thankful to be able to offer this honor song, this very old honor song for Joe and his legacy, his memory uh, that continues to be very strong today and live on in so many of us and in so many ways. Thank you to our speakers, Governor Gianforte, family, friends, and public for celebrating these Montana treasures. While we are not able to gather in person this year, everyone's enthusiasm for this virtual ceremony has made this event no less special. If you have a chance to visit the Capitol building, please take some time to view the panels of Mildred Walker, Joseph Medicine Crow, and the rest of the outstanding Montanans that are honored in the gallery. Thank you.